One of the most basic constitutional responsibilities that a prosecutor has is to disclose or to turn over to the defense exculpatory evidence. That is, evidence that might suggest that the person accused of the crime is actually innocent of the crime. The Supreme Court has held that that's a constitutional responsibility uh, of prosecutors. The failure to turn over that evidence has often been what's led to the conviction of innocent people. One of those innocent people is John Thompson, uh, who was uh, arrested in January 1985 in New Orleans when he was just 22 years old, accused in two separate crimes, one of armed robbery and the other of murder, uh, ultimately convicted uh, of those crimes. He spent 18 years in the custody uh, of the Louisiana prison system, 14 of those years on death row, and he came very close to being executed on May the 20th, 1999. I want to ask John Thompson what happened to pick up the story at this point and tell us what happened uh, just as he was there within a month of execution. Uh, John Thompson, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Could you pick up the story and tell us what happened there in the days right before you were to be put to death by the state of Louisiana? Oh, uh, well, ooh. Well, you know how, how my lawyers tell the story. It was, it was interesting that they say that, you know, due to the fact that we had then exhausted all my remedies, I was through with the courthouse. Um, it was nothing else for them to do other than trying to find a way to maybe even file the ineffective system of counsels on themselves. These just was trying to look at, um, they feel like they, they let me down, they failed me. So they, the first thing, they, when, when they told me that what they was trying to do is, I was kind of shocked and I asked them not to do that to themselves, but hire some more investigators. And that's what they did. Um, with, with nothing else left to do, we had two cases. Our own robbery case, what I received in 49 and a half years for, that happened maybe two weeks after the murder happened. Um, um, he, had, he was looking for a, a five feet seven description with a big bush. Um, the murder suspect was a six feet tall with a bald head. Um, so to say these two incidents happened two weeks apart, um, my lawyers was really, you know, amused about the fact that he prosecuted the same individual at both descriptions. And so I was always trying to prove it's hard, like, it's one of the, it's hard to try to convince a group of lawyers that you're innocent of one charge. That's down to say, hold on, I'm innocent of both of these charges. It really didn't have them really take it to really want to fight it at first until everything else was out of the door. My murder case was through. So once they decided to take up on it, they hired another investigator that can come in with totally new eyes, totally new view. It was just basically because I was totally out of any other appeals or any other opportunity for to save my life. Um, holy behold, right off the top, at the first beginning of the transcript of my transcript, what was asked was, it was a tricky situation. It was a motion to, a motion I was just going in the arrangement to plead guilty or not guilty to the murder charge. Right. And it was during the course of me going into the courtroom to plead guilty to the murder charge, three little kids was in a coat and identified me at that time and said that I am the perpetrator that robbed them. The district attorney let it be known that I was identified in open court as a robbery suspect. My attorneys at the time was thinking I'm just going in there for arrangement for the murder. And so they started arguing the case with the district attorney and the judge saying that this is a very unfair identification. Mr. Thompson coming in the court by himself. But they thinking that I was being identified in the murder case. But I well, wasn't. Let me just be sure. You're brought into court. You're the only person who's a defendant. And these three witnesses are there and they identify you as being the perpetrator of this crime. Uh, of the crime of robbing them. Right. Um, um, now, give and take that, they, they describe the person perpetrator as being five feet seven with a big bush. Right. I'm, although that was my height and my hairstyle at the time when I was arrested. Right. right now you're looking at a five feet seven man with a bald head. Uh huh. Because the system, when you first get arrested, the first thing they did me was cut all my hair off. Right. Because they was trying to make me look like the six feet tall bald head man that committed the murder of Ray LaLuza. Right. All right. So, so there are two crimes, they're two weeks apart, one is the armed robbery and one is the murder. 
One and they're the, saying the same person can, can, uh, committed both crimes, even though the descriptions were completely different. Completely different. The murder happened first, December right. the 6th. The robbery happened second. So when you arrest me, when you realize that I don't have no... So what happened was, in the course of them being um, evaluating how to proceed with this particular case, the district attorney office, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking in terms of, they brought me into this um, very um, highly favorable to them suggestion of identifying me as a perpetrator. Right. But because of my lawyers and them thinking that this was, I was being identified as a murder, they arguing the case. They're not really paying attention to what the other district attorney is asking the judge. The other district attorney is asking the judge to have all of my blood withdrawn. Right. Uh, um, because of evidence obvious that was left on the scene of the crime. And, right. Um, and so what happened was um, my lawyers were so busy arguing with them about the identification, he didn't even hear the request. But once they realized and my lawyers came to a conclusion that this wasn't about the murder, not even all the way back, all the way up. They didn't back up off the arguments, didn't back. They went to saying, oh, we can't be on this case no longer. We don't want to represent Mr. Thompson no longer. That's what the conversation went towards. Once they realized this was totally different, there was about a whole new issue. They were saying, well, we obligated to other cases. We need to get off of this case right now. And the judge refused to let them off the case, and he made them be my attorney. But go back to the original thing was, the attorney, the, dep um, the um, public defender office to represent me in these robbery cases. That same public defender office that said he couldn't represent me in a murder case. That's was why I was here with. That's was why it was two weeks. Uh, two weeks later, I made this arrangement for my murder. Right. It's because I had to go through them finding me private attorneys because the public defender office said he couldn't represent me in his murder case because I was someone that um, he the office felt that I was guilty and he, his office felt it like that. You know the victim family. So Mr. Bertel said, not only could I can't represent him, I don't believe nobody in my office. Could represent him in this matter. So, so the blood turned out to be very important evidence in the last days of what was supposed to be the last days of your life, right? Exactly. So, 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 so how the process went is, we, we assuming I'm just a, a sub, assumption now that I was born in Charity Hospital in New Orleans, you know. So it wasn't hard for them to find out what my blood type was. As a district attorney, the only thing you gotta do is call a district call the hospital and realize and just ask them about my blood type and he would have right. given them that information. So we had to do the fact that the district attorney never followed up that request that he made from the judge to have my blood withdrawn. He found out that that answer without having my blood drawn. Okay. So the day they decided to take this armed robbery case and pursue it before they pursue the murder case. So they decided to prosecute me for this armed robbery case. They got three little kids saying that I'm the one robbing. They got Newman Bertel representing me. Mr. Bertel, the office claimed that he couldn't represent me in the murder, but all of a sudden he could represent me now in this robbery case. I've tried to protest it. It didn't go because I couldn't afford to turn the court say you're going to get with the court upon you. So I was supposed to go to trial with Mr. Bertel. Mr. Bertel waited till the last day of the trial, the day before my trial, to come and see me for the, the first day before time. your trial. The day before my trial was the first time I seen Mr. Bertel. Your the, lawyer, your defense lawyer at the trial. The first time you saw your defense lawyer at the trial was the night before your trial. The night before my trial. Which was the first time I learned when this incident happened. When they say that this robbery sport had took place. So once they told me when the robbery took place, I just fell back in relief because I realized where I was at that particular day. I knew I was at work, and I knew I could prove I was at work. I knew I could have witnesses to come and testify that I was at work, and that's just what happened. I was able to tell Mr. Bertel where to go and find my witness, who to bring to the court, and how to talk to him and find. And that one night, he was able to do just that. So he was able to bring back and testify the next day in court for me, four or five of my co-workers, time sheets, my supervisor, and all. So these kids said he was robbed by the Superdome. I was working at the Miserable Auditorium that night. It was December the 28th. When he said December 28th, that's the first start of Mardi Gras season. So I know where I was at, that was to buy Mardi Gras bar. I'm supposed to get paid five, $600 cash money. Why would I go out and try to rob kids? 
All right. right. So right. then they try to say I change uniforms. I, I put on from black to, to jeans and go ride these kids and come back and change back into my uniform. They, they made it seem like these people at work couldn't actually account for me for eight hours. They could only say I was there and they see me at one given time. But the day say I left and ran and robbed the kids and came back and do it. That's how he went off and explained. The jury believed it because the three kids were saying I did it. Never at my trial did anything about blood came up. Never. Nothing right. concerning blood evidence was taken from the scene of the crime. Nothing was saying that we heard about a struggle took place, but nothing was saying about blood evidence or anything. Come to find out the day of my trial, the district attorney went to the evidence room to collect all the physical evidence and threw the physical evidence away. Threw the blood pants, tennis shoes away, threw the blood um, pants leg away. That was confiscated from the crime scene when, when the robbery first took place. When the robbery took place, it was a scuffle between the perpetrator and the victim, one of the victims. <coughs> Excuse me. That struggle led to um, blood being left on the um, victim pants, leg, and tennis shoes. That was from the perpetrator. Um, the police confiscated that blood immediately, timely came to the scene of the right. crime. That blood went straight to the crime lab to be tested. That's why the DA, the first question was from the district attorney during the course of me being identified in open court to have my, requesting that the judge have my blood withdraw to which the judge uh, granted that motion to the right. defense. Um, like I say, they, this investigator quickly, quickly recognized a request for my blood was made at the beginning of, of her transcript when she first began her investigation, when this charge first came about. So she looked in the transcript to find out what happened and when I was first initially charged with this case, my first court appearance. And that's the first thing she recognized. The, the court assignments that did type that into play. Even though all the other argument was going on, she did type in the request that the DA made and the judge responds granting him that request to have my blood withdrawn, all right? Never did he ever come to have my blood withdrawn. Never did Mr. Bertel and them ever know anything about blood evidence existed um, in this crime at all. Um, weird to say is when all this was first discovered, when when we first discovered the blood was uh, evidence, they did have blood evidence. They went, first thing they went back to do is look at the evidence. Went straight to the evidence and seeing all the evidence that was collected. Then look, look at the police reports and so forth, right? Exactly. Then we recognize in a, in a bunch of the murder, in the, in the murder trial, in a bunch of the lot of police reports, a lot of different po police reports were stuck in there that really just didn't make sense to the murder case. When we quickly realized that's where it did make sense because it belonged in the robbery. So it yeah. was obvious that they were stuffing it in the murder trial to try to keep it out of the, the um, um, robbery um, police report in, in, in records of the district attorney office, all right? But so when we really went through it and realized that physical evidence was taken and the physical evidence was to the crime lab, she went straight to the crime lab and figured out where the evidence was, what was happening. We realized that the blood evidence had been tested and they had a final result of the blood test. And it was given and it was sent to the district attorney office himself. One of the district attorneys himself went signed for the results of the evidence. And, and, and so he claimed that he placed it on the head district attorney desk. The head district attorney claimed he'd never seen it before. Well, what did it say? It said that Mr. Thompson was exclusive. I wasn't responsible. It wasn't my blood. There were it two blood it. types and neither one was your blood type. I mean, it just so happened, my, praise God, my, my blood type was the same as the victim. Right. And, and, the, and, and, the, and the perpetrator blood type was totally different. And so it was like, it was just a blessing that me and the victim had the same type of blood. Because if I'd had that other blood like the perpetrator had, like a lot of, like majority of the people do have, I think it was O and B. I can't remember which way it was, but I I know me and the victim is have a rare blood, and they say we not you know normally the ones that they used to be a plentiful the other way around, and so I could have easily been switched over on that side and not have been dead for a crime I didn't commit. How but, how soon was this, or how what relationship and time was there between when this was discovered that you could not have possibly done this robbery and your execution date? Um. A month, maybe about, I had been got within them 35 days. I had to receive the date, 
You know, you, they can't give you an execution date. You got to be 35 days warning. Right. So I had to receive that 35, that, that execution date. I was scheduled to die May the 21st. My son was scheduled to graduate May the 20th. So the result of that is your convictions for both the armed robbery and the murder. Because the armed robbery was used at your murder trial to convict you and also to keep you from testifying. Is that right? Yes, sir. That was the whole plot. That was the whole strategy plan. It was weird because even after the conviction, so now Mr. Burtell fighting, right? Because now he realized that y'all trying to railroad this innocent man. Here go this people telling y'all he was at work and y'all still trying to prosecute him. So now this man that think I'm guilty of a murder, now he trying to fight. Right. He fight, but he just got too much against him. Right. It was just like they had to railroad him, they had to stole all the evidence. They had deliberately went throw the physical evidence away to make sure that he could never find it. That evidence had never been returned back to the evidence room. I'm, like, I'm trying to figure out how deep this conspiracy really was because you got a person that worked in the evidence room that that's his only job is when people sign in and signing out the evidence, you know? Right. So if you can sign some evidence out and never bring it back, no alarm's gonna go off here and tell nobody that these district attorneys came and took some blood evidence away from the evidence room and didn't return it. He don't tell nobody this. I'm, I'm, you know, and right now he's still back there handling evidence. I'm kind of like, what kind of, what? Why do we have this procedure here if you're not gonna notify someone when somebody do not return physical evidence back? And that's, that was, a, to me, embarrassing to our criminal justice system. That part alone. We ain't got to go through nobody else. Right. That, bring the, that, that would have killed anything right. that was going on if he would have did his job. Nobody even questioned him about his job. As to this day, he had yet to answer to why he did not notify someone when the district attorney office didn't bring him that physical evidence back. But at... I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, tell us this. I mean, now you had a retrial, right, on both these charges, right? Yes, sir. And what but, happened? Well, the, the thing is, all the way during the robbery, after the robbery conviction, everybody understood I hadn't had a conviction. I, I was I was a clean, I had a clean, right. pretty much a decent record. And so what what happened was the my lawyers at my murder trial tried to ask the judge not to allow that conviction to be held against me because I want to take the stand in my murder case. Right. And the judge said, if he take the stand, I'm allowed to, to, to use it. That's the law. My lawyer told him, my lawyer was kind of smart. Patrick Fannin was a, a seasoned vet. So Pat, Pat came back and told him, well, I won't put a writ to the full circuit court of appeal because this is not a final conviction. How can you use a conviction that's not final? It hadn't even been on appeal yet. Right. And, and so in the, in, in, in the judge said, well, if he get on that stand, I'm allowed him to use it. Take your writ. And so that's the best thing that could have happened to me. Pat the Phantom took that writ to the full circuit and asking them not to allow the court to use that conviction against me. The full circuit agreed with the judge and said that if, if I take the stand, the DA got a right to use it. Now, this so, is at your first trial. This is a trial where you were convicted, right? The trials I convicted. So now when I get the reversal for this armed robbery, it automatically opened up the door for them to review my murder case. Right. Because I didn't know what you just not said. I requested through the court records and all that I wanted to testify in my own behalf. Right. But you did you determined to say that you were gonna use this conviction against me and therefore you deprived me of my right to testify in my own behalf. And right. so the full circuit court of appeal came back and said yeah, we was a part of that, and guess what? Y'all told him y'all was going to use it against him, so he deserved a new trial. So now, going back to a new trial, it's a whole different ball game now, because now I'm just with the murder. So now they know they don't have a case against me because they know the perpetrator who committed the crime was the one that they cut the deal with, Kevin Freeman. They know he fit He the was the person who accused you. He was the person who accused me. He fit the description, six feet tall, medium built, bald head. He fit the full description of, of, of all our witnesses who, who give description of saying anybody had. It just was the fact that I didn't want to say that he did it, that he had no case. And so they had to use him against me then because they had to make a conviction. They didn't worry about that. From once I wouldn't testify the way they wanted, that's when they put the own robberies on me. One, right. I wouldn't tell them that Kevin Freeman did it. And they wanted me to say Kevin Freeman did it and I was there and I know it. I don't know nothing. I don't know what Kevin Freeman did. I wasn't with him. If you know he did it, you convict him then. And so I, if I you, if you, let me be sure I understand. If you had been willing to say that Kevin had committed the crime and that you were there, they would have cut a deal with you. 
Yes. And instead, they cut a deal with Kevin, who apparently was the person who committed the crime, who got out of it by saying you did it. Is that right? That, that's simple. That's simple as ABC. Um, was, like I say, the only thing I do is look at it. Look at before anybody was caught. Look right. at what all the witnesses were saying, how the perpetrator looked. Right. Every witness gave the same description. They didn't say no one person. I mean, no two people did it. They said one. Right. You know, Kevin Freeman was the only person that put two people on at the scene of the crime. Well, what right. happened at your second trial? What happened when the jury, you testified, right? And you told them you weren't there and, and so forth, I right? I testified. But not only that, we found we had, you know, it was a lot more than about the blood evidence. There's so much physical evidence was would tell from us in the robbery case as well, especially all of these other witnesses. We right. didn't even know these other witnesses took place. We didn't know they had all these other witnesses that gave different descriptions. We didn't know, we didn't know they had all these other witnesses. Some witnesses were so scared that they moved because they told the DA, that ain't the man I seen running away. And the DA just so ignored the witnesses. Oh, boy. And no witness got so scared they left New Orleans. Because he's saying that that man knew I seen him, and that man gonna come back and get me. You know, we had some incredible witness that that came and testified to things that that was withheld from us by these same district attorneys. And so, like you got right now, the jury took less than the down. It took thirty about thirty five minutes all together. After you know the that's the for you to pick um, a, a jury former and all of that. And, and then go over evidence, but I, I'm more than sure it probably took just as long for them to, to, to find a foreman and a jury than it took them to come back with the verdict. You know, um, so so but, they yeah. found you. They found you not guilty in 35 minutes. Yes, sir. <laughs> 35. So you, had, you had spent 18 years in prison, and 14 of those years on death row, and the jury took 35 minutes to say you were not guilty. See, I was not guilty. After they heard all what happened, all what the DA did, they, you know, we was allowed because Freeman, the person who testified against me at the first trial, was dead. He was he was killed robbing somebody else. Oh. You know, people don't understand when we have these wrongful convictions, and then you hear these stories like mine because they got some stories just as incredible than mine. You know this, right. so. When, you, when we hear these acts of these district attorneys and we see this, we don't look at, well, what this perpetrator did to someone else. Who gave him the right to, to unleash this individual on the rest of society? So we, when we're saying that we, what all he destroyed in this one individual life, we're just looking at it like that. But what if that perpetrator, he allowed to go out there and commit, c continue to hurt our society, continue to hurt citizens? This man was killed robbing someone else. So someone and if else. He, if he had been convicted originally of this crime, he would have never been out on the streets. So now look what this man got to deal with. This man now got to deal with the fact that he didn't kill the man. Right. This was this was just district trying to put on this man. Right. That he killed the man that shouldn't even been outside. Shouldn't even been free to walk around and hurt anybody again. And he could have probably been very well lost his life, which made him decide he needed to use physical force to kill him. So right. it's so much that so much responsibilities go into these cases and for us to say that we don't have a system now that, that decide we didn't see enough crazy cases to us as adults and as, 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 as people that should be responsible for criminal justice system. We didn't see enough outrageous behavior on district attorney to say this do happen and it happened a lot. Well, let me ask you this. You, you tried to hold the prosecutor accountable here, right? You, you sued the district attorney's office and you claim that not only had they withheld this evidence in your case, but that there was a whole group of cases there in New Orleans. This was in New Orleans. This was a parish, uh, Orleans Parish District Attorney's Office, which had had a number of cases reversed because of hiding evidence and withholding evidence that showed innocence. Uh, tell us just, we've got a limited amount of time, but tell us what happened uh, with regard to your lawsuit. You know, it, 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 you know, it's kind of it's kind of weird because it was it was a power play in in every aspect of it. You know, it was so political it got to the point where what was at stake had then lost its value. Um, what was really at stake had then lost its value from the fact that I come in the, out of the Orleans Parish where all this happened. That way. most cases don't even make it to the docket. Most cases get totally turned down, saying that 
prosecutor have immunity, all right? right? But this was a so outrageous case, and this, it was not only was this outrageous, we had a former district attorney who Harry Connie had hired to oversee a grand jury investigation of his own office, came to a conclusion that I can indict at least five of y'all, five of these district attorneys, Mr. Connie. And Mr. Connie refused to accept him, uh, allow him that opportunity to do just that. So he resigned. We had him as our key witness. And right. He was willing to say all the corrupt things that was happening inside of that system. That's what the jury believed. Not nothing that we would say, but what he investigated, what he discovered, and what he said. So the jury said that it's no way in the world, Mr. Connie, y'all continue to do this over and over and over again. It's no way in the world we're going to allow them to get away with this here. We're going to show y'all who was who this city is really supposed to be and what it's supposed to represent. And so when he found them responsible and rewarded us this, what was amazing from there was the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. So here come the first round of appeals where I win. Three well, first of all, let's back up. The jury gave you a verdict of $14 million. Is that right? Yes. And, yes, and another $1 million to pay for the attorney's fees. So you had a verdict of $15 million. Yes. You appealed, the, the state appealed that to or the Orleans Parish to the Court of Appeals, which, which divided evenly, so that was upheld. Uh, and then it went to the Supreme no, Court no, of the United no, no, States. No, 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 slow back. Back it down a little bit. That's okay. what I was talking about. That's where, the, that's where the corrupt stuff stuff popping up at. You got to realize what we're dealing with, especially when our Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. We got to, like, we, I don't know what's wrong with it, but it's structured and it's messed up. Because this what happened. My first round of appeals, I won it 3 0. Three right. judges was in my favor. They call an unborn hearing on them three judges. Right. They was trying to override. Three of these brother judges had to agree that this was messed up. So somebody, however it's done, I don't know what the process is that we can override three of our brothers that made a decision on this case. Because right. when you call an unborn hearing, that's what you were trying to do. Right. You were trying to override this decision. So if that's a place for our, first of all, right there, that should be alone. Is that a place for our criminal justice system? Is that how our system was set up? Because some other judges don't agree with, with, with these three judges who, who we give a lifetime commitment to to do this job. We say, oh, we ain't satisfied with these decisions, so we're going to challenge these decisions. So we try to override it. Right. And then we still come with a divided code. Right. Now we get, so that's kind of crazy. How you don't think? Think about that concept. What this mean? What other issues this they play this kind of game with? That's right. important. That's meaning it's not the people's choice. It's not it's not the will of the people if you go use your political power. I would like to know who had that kind of power. We need to know who them people are because if it's some decisions that really affect the people, this is how we set up the system to work. Not for you to have some other political power to pull that strength if you want to, and you just happen to try to pull a strength that you just didn't win. But it was 8-8. Eight, eight. That's still messed up. But you That's still came still out with the jury verdict sustained, right? So what that means to the United States Supreme Court? They shouldn't even been looking at it. This right. shouldn't even been a case the United now we're gonna go a little higher. We right. go a little higher. This should be a case that the United States Supreme Court shouldn't even been trying to trying to see or hear. But of this course is what they're concerned. Of course I'm coming with a three nothing verdict for us right. concerned. So right. why is it listen at this? It was a state matter, state issue itself. They sell it, they sell. It ain't coming in two to one with that one having a powerful opinion that, you know what, we need to intervene here. They ain't three nothing. They shouldn't even been reviewing it at all. It was, it, it was kind of crazy that they was even reviewing this at all, period. Well, let, let, so let, me ask you, let me ask you this, John Thompson. Uh, when, when were you released from, uh, from death row? Um, in 203. Um, May the 5th, coming up, coming up next month. So tell us what you've been doing and what adjustments you've been making to going from being locked down in Angola, the notorious Louisiana State Penitentiary, uh, since you've been in the free world. Well, one of the, one of the things we do is like we was advocates. You know, they forced me to fight the system. You know, I, you know, once I took on the lawsuit and, and, and we accomplished things that most people say couldn't be done. 
Right now, we got the whole world looking at wrongful conviction now. You know, we got them looking at prosecuting misconduct now. We, I didn't have a pound. I didn't have pounds in maybe five or six different states. Right now, with the Innocent Project, we've been uh, focusing on accountability. Putting, um, you could go to prosecutor oversight um, and see um, some of the, um, what the people that's holding, supposed to be holding these people accountable, what they are saying. Why are they not holding them accountable? And you'll be shocked. If, you know, if a judge said, well, I could see this district attorney doing all this bad stuff, but I cannot discipline him because I know his family. This right. is how he eat. You know, and, and, and the reality is, well, forget about him killing an innocent man. You were worried about this, how he take care of his family. So that is a real part of society that some issues that it then got a little deeper that we got to deal with. We got to understand. We got to learn. So that been my biggest passion right now to, like, educate society about in most cases, we're giving these guys our life. We're right. putting our life in the, in the hands. Surely we need to hold them accountable. And, and we can't keep playing with this premeditated thought of murder. Because when we can say a person could pre-plan to kill someone, and you got a prosecutor who got to use that same strategy to do that same thing. If we could prove overwhelmingly that he had information in his possession that this man was innocent, Yet he still pursued. Mr. Bright, you do know that a sentencing phase is a totally different trial. Right. So for right. you to come out of that, that criminal and getting that conviction, right. from you if, as a prosecutor, if you don't know you convicted innocent man, you should have known by that time. Right. So so if you're gonna still use bad judgment from then on, because you got a conviction, you got him off the streets, for you to pursue to kill him. I, you know, it's kind of hard for me. And to of course, to in your case, it was pretty clear from the start once they got those blood results that, that you could not have committed that crime. So here we got Jim Williams then prosecuted eight of us on that put us all on that row out of Orleans Parish. He went from Orleans to Jefferson Parish. Right. Four of us is home free. Right. All of them off of that row. All of them that received some form of reversal. So that's just one man name in seven or eight different cases. Right. Then I look around and look at some of the other. I see Jack people name in all of these other cases. So right. you got individuals that deliberately did this over and over and over again for our higher code to look at this information and say, oh, this is not going on. Oh, y'all need to show a pattern. For for a higher code to reverse any one of these cases on these type of serious issues and for the Bar Association or the Disciplinary Board not to take up on themselves at that point, it's no complaint need to be filed for as I'm concerned. The higher code just not told you what happened. Right. So why do me, that couldn't afford an attorney at all, why should it be on me to file a complaint against this attorney? Because I, it's obvious that I didn't have attorneys before. The code appointed me each attorney that I had. So you asking me to file a complaint after all of this didn't been happening to me, it's the only way you can consider putting this person in discipline and putting this in person in check. No matter how many times he abused it, no matter how many times he tried to kill innocent people, come on, the record reflect itself. The, you know, however many times the name showed up in these reversible cases, at the same name, this man had a problem. He shouldn't well, John, be still practicing law. Well, John, you, you, you have told us a, a great deal about uh, failure to disclose and turn over evidence uh, of innocence. You've told us about accountability uh, and about just a remarkable experience, 18 years of your life being taken away uh, and the work you're doing now uh, to, to try to hold people accountable and to try to deal with this problem. And as you say, there are a number of other exonerated people. And I know one of the other things you've been doing is working with people who've been exonerated and are now released in, into the community. Uh, but I want to thank you uh, for taking your time and being with us here today and, 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 and letting us know from a personal experience of someone who went through this and experienced this, uh, what it was like. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Good to talk. All right, thank you. I love that y'all report too. Y'all did an excellent report on prosecutor accountability here. Well, thank you. I loved it that too. So thank y'all very much for y'all help. You. All right.